Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And my pleasure to introduce uh, Toma Yavitz, Dr. Toma Yavitz, who has been here for six months, five months now, as a member of the Institute. So Toma was formerly of this parish. He did his undergraduate degree here in Princeton, and then he uh, decided to leave and do things like make money and have a family and move into the so-called real world um, before coming back to do his PhD at Columbia. Um, Thomas Ghost has haunted me for quite a long time in that when I first got into Galactic Dynamics, the reason I did was that I did a course with John McGorin at Oxford, and I was introduced to the lead-off cosine mechanism via a paper that Scott wrote with Thomas back at Princeton on why do Earth satellites stay off? Um, <coughs> he realized that that was his real purpose in life. So he came back to Columbia and he did half of his PhD on fuzzy dark matter with Lambry, and the other half, which is a half I think we're going to hear about today, on stellar streams and probes over the dark matter potential in our own galaxy. So, uh, take away. Thank you very much. Oh my God, this doesn't hurt you too much. <laughs> Um, so thank you, Chris. Thank you all for, for coming. Um, uh, I'm excited to talk today about stellar streams as probes of galactic structure uh, and dark matter halos. Um, I'll just dive right into it. Uh, okay, so what am I going to tell you today? Uh, I'm told that it's good to tell people in advance what to expect, so that if you don't like this slide, you can leave right now. Um, I will try to explain that resonances uh, in non-spherical halos break up the galactic orbital structure into orbit families. Uh, kind of a brief theoretical uh, initial part of this talk. Um, I'll then explain that stellar streams, uh, if you look at their morphology, you can in theory detect uh, the location of the existence and the location of these resonances. Uh, and then using that, you can constrain the shape and the, and the, the, shape and the characteristics of the galactic potential. Uh, and then finally, I'll, uh, if I have enough time at the end, um, uh, I might use that, that, that last, the last few minutes to talk about how today's uh, Milky Way stellar stream catalog uh, is beginning to be rich enough to actually probe these things. Uh, I might even mention streams in other galaxies if I get there, uh, but that is the general uh, overview of what, I would, what I'd like to talk to you today. Um, to, to, to start things out, uh, I think it's always good to anchor this in what what I, what, I think, what I think my job is as a galactic dynamicist, uh, and one of the main elements of my job is connecting between gravitational potentials and orbits. Um, so here's the galaxy, it's surrounded by a big dark matter halo, we think. Uh, if you know, if you were to know what that dark matter halo is, or if you had some other way of figuring out exactly what is the potential, uh, you can integrate an orbit in this galaxy and you can figure out exactly what any star should do. And this is a typical galactic orbit and a typical, what we think is a typical galactic potential. Uh, and so this is nice. You could also go the other way. Uh, if you know what the orbit is, if you see the orbit kind of evolving in the sky, uh, you can then infer uh, what, what, what must the potential be in order to host or to support uh, such an orbit. Uh, you can't maybe you can't get it exactly, but you can certainly constrain the shape of the potential based on what you see the orbit doing. Uh, this is not a new thing. Uh, people have been doing this. Uh, astronomers have been doing using this uh, to to study the solar system for centuries. Uh, this talk almost worked out perfect in terms of timing. Uh, in three days, it will be the 242nd anniversary uh, of the disco discovery of Uranus, uh, or the the discovery that Uranus is a planet. Uh, that, that is orbiting the sun. Um, interestingly, about 65 years later, the next planet, Neptune, was discovered. And the reason it was discovered 65 years after the discovery of Uranus is because it took astronomers about 65 years to observe almost a complete orbit of Uranus uh, to see that that orbit isn't in line with the existing mass distribution that was known at the time. They figured out there must be something else tugging at Uranus to, to perturb it from that expected orbit. Uh, they figured out where they thought it should be. They turned their telescopes there, and lo and behold, there was Neptune. Um, so bottom line, you, you see orbits. You can infer the mass distribution, in this case, mass distribution of planets in the solar system. Uh, and so we want to play a similar game in the Milky Way. The problem, or one of the problems that we face with the Milky Way is that unlike the solar system, where we can sit and observe over many nights and see these orbits in the Milky Way, the, lo the longer you sit, the more you'll just see the same picture. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the time scales involved here are millions of years, a typical star, the solar radius uh, of the sun, for example, uh, will orbit the Milky Way once every 200, 250 or so million years. 
So it's not like you can actually sit and watch and expect to see Uranus orbit once around and figure out what is the, what is the potential that is inducing that orbit. Uh, so we have a snapshot. What can we do with a snapshot? How can we use a snapshot to uh, infer or determine the meta distribution? How do we see an orbit in a snapshot? Uh, and so one of the tools that we have come to use over the past few decades is this thing called stellar streams. Uh, stellar streams are the, the, the product of when a small object like a globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy uh, falls into a bigger object like a galaxy like the Milky Way uh, and gets tidally uh, destroyed, tidally stripped. Uh, as it is falling in, or maybe it's maybe it's formed in the Milky Way and is tidally stripped uh, as it evolves. Uh, and you can actually model this, you know, uh, simulate this very easily with just test particles. That turns out to be a pretty accurate uh, 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 depiction of what's going on. What you're seeing here, you can make out the little gray line. That's the orbit of the progenitor, uh, and you can see that along that orbit, you have a bunch of stars that are slowly spreading out. Uh, as this thing evolves over time, uh, newer stars are linked closer, but the, the, the stars that are uh, initially stripped kind of spread out further along this, uh, this progenitor orbit. I don't know if anybody can see the laser. I certainly can't see them. So, um, so anyway, so uh, bottom line, at the end of this, this picture, you've got your orbit that's more or less traced by the stars that have been stripped from the stream. So here we have a snapshot, and we've essentially found an orbit, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's not exactly an orbit. I can talk about that. It's but it's pretty close and uh, you can do a pretty good job of figuring out what the orbit of the progenitor was uh, to have formed a stream along this, this track. Uh, and we see these things. This is a picture of Pal 5 uh, in actual data and our Lyra stars, uh, again, forming that, that long thin filamentary structure. What Pal 5 is one of the streams that we've uh, known to exist for a while uh, around the Milky Way. Um, a little bit more on how you get this structure. Uh, one way that's, I think, very, very easy to understand kind of why you get a thin filamentary structure uh, uh, that you can see and observe uh, is if you convert to uh, from, from phase space, from, from X and V uh, position and velocity to what we call action uh, angle coordinates. Uh, generally, a lot of dynamics becomes a lot easier uh, when you convert to actions and angles because your actions uh, are constant and your angles evolve linearly over time. Uh, and the frequency that governs the evolution of the angles uh, is just the partial uh, of the Hamiltonian with respect to the actions. Uh, so if you find these convenient coordinates, uh, evolution in, in a potential becomes very easy to calculate because again, you've got a set of coordinates that are constants uh, and a set of coordinates that evolve linearly over time. And then you could, you could project that back and figure out where uh, your star is at any given moment. Um, we can take a step further and say, okay, we believe that our progenitor, our globular cluster for, for this case is leaking out the stars and those stars are spreading out. And the reason we see kind of this long filamentary structure or any, any kind of uh, structure that we see must involve some, uh, some delta frequency, some, some de delta angle, basically a change in where you are along the orbit uh, to spread you out the way we saw these uh, streams spreading out. So this de delta theta uh, is theta, of the ith particle uh, that was leaked from the progenitor uh, minus the theta of the, the location of the progenitor currently theta naught. Uh, and that is just delta omega t plus whatever initial spread between angles you had. Um, now, you wait enough, a long enough time, the initial spread in your angles that you have when you leak the particles is insignificant compared to uh, this delta omega t term because that just grows with time. Uh, and you can also, well, the assumption we typically make here is that your uh, initial spread of actions, uh, basically the spread of leaked particles from this uh, progenitor object is much smaller than the size of your galaxy or the scale of actions in this galaxy. Uh, and so you can, um, you can, uh, you, you end up being able to approximate the frequency of any particle, any star that's been stripped from this uh, using a basic Taylor expansion of the frequencies. Uh, this is the Hessian, object, which gives you basically the, the second order term uh, that lets you expand the frequencies. Uh, and then you can write out your delta theta. Again, this is delta theta is how spread out the stream is uh, as a function of this Hessian, which then relates things back to the spread in action space to begin. So if you know, if you have any way of prescribing or figuring out what is your spread in action, that delta J, uh, and you know what the Hamiltonian is, you can figure out what this stream or what any kind of configuration uh, should look like, assuming these, these assumptions I made on top. 
Um, it turns out, and you, or this has to be the case if you get long filamentary structures that are one-dimensional, uh, that this Hessian uh, matrix has to have one dominant eigenvalue. Um, if, you, if it wasn't one dominant eigenvalue, you wouldn't get a one-dimensional uh, structure. Um, uh, and so you can then again, you can relate your, your spread in, uh, in, in angles to this one direction that's, uh, that's governed by the Hessian uh, related again to the spread in actions. Uh, to draw a picture of what is going on here, I'll just go back to a paper from now 20, 25 years ago almost. This is Helmy and White, one of the more important papers on that started this rush into streams. There's a few others, uh, one by my PhD advisor, um, Catherine, one by Scott, uh, all kind of touching on similar aspects of this idea of forming a stream from a disrupting uh, cluster in, in a galaxy. What are you seeing here? You're seeing this initial blob in action space up here, uh, in action and angle space. And as you let this thing evolve over time, your actions remain constant. So you're not changing anything vertically, but your angles are spreading out and they're spreading out at different frequencies. Again, this is your delta omega. Uh, and so over time you shear in, in action angle space like this, uh, very kind of easy uh, thing to, to visualize. Uh, the main thing I wanna just draw here because we wanna come to this later. So you've got, actions, you've got angles. Your actions are constant. You're not changing actions if the Hamiltonian is well-behaved and integral, integrable, and every particle is just moving along this flow very, very orderly. Uh, and your movement, your velocity essentially, or your speed along this plot is different because it's governed by these differences in frequencies. So if you start out with a line, that line slowly shears exactly that which you see there. Very good, very simple. Uh, that's how you get this nice, clean, one-dimensional structure in the galaxy. And we see these things, and we've seen these things for a while. This is a famous picture called Field of Streams. Um, uh, we've gone much further since this. This is early 2000s, I think, or mid 2000s. Uh, and here, all they've done is they've colored stars based on their distance from us. Uh, you can see kind of as, your, as, as the gradient changes, you see these, these filamentary structures. Uh, so you see this big, this big kind of <laughs> somewhat one-dimensional object is the Sagittarius stream that's in dwarf galaxy. Uh, you can see PAL5, which I showed earlier, uh, right down here. It's a globular cluster stream. Uh, so we see these, these objects in the, actual, in, the, in the Milky Way in actual data, which implies that these theories are in some way working uh, and that these uh, are, you know, our, our general assumption of progenitors uh, uh, spreading across orbits. There's, there's at least something behind that that we can use to study uh, the Milky Way and its potential. Uh, we can do better than the field of streams. You can certainly uh, select for proper motion. So if you look at the plot all the way on the right, you've just selected for co-moving stars, stars that are all moving in the same direction because again, the stream is all moving along more or less the same orbit. So if you select for that, you see cleaner pictures of streams. So here, this is a, a stream called GD1. Uh, you see a nice long kind of thin filament. You can do even better than this <coughs> if you go to photometry, because again, these streams are formed from a, an object, usually a globular cluster, in this case, a globular cluster. Globular clusters, I won't say they have one population of stars, because that's an area of active debate, but they have a very cohesive population of stars. So you can uh, pick out your, your track in an HR diagram or, or a color magnitude diagram uh, and filter just for those stars, and you get an even sharper picture uh, of the stream than you did from just proper motion. Uh, so generally, this is kind of a game that observers nowadays play to find these streams in the data. Uh, and we see more and more of them with new uh, surveys, uh, dark energy survey, Gaia, uh, further iterations of SDSS. We now have a catalog of closing in on 100 stellar streams from dwarf galaxies uh, and globular clusters in the Milky Way. And so you all should be saying, all right, Tom, this is the end of the talk. You've got a lot of orbits. You can figure out the potential. What's why are we still here? Um, this, this, should be, this should be it. Uh, it turns out we've discovered more streams. We've also discovered a, lot, a whole lot more complications uh, into modeling these streams and figuring out, inferring based on the streams uh, and what we think their orbits are, what is the actual shape of the potential. Uh, and so I like to label this, uh, this part of the talk that stellar streams uh, misbehave uh, in our data. Um, so unlike this, picture that we would have liked to believe where each stream responds nicely to an orbit. And then we can look at all these orbits in one simple potential that isn't evolving, is not changing, and is just as defined by a smooth 
uh, form. Turns out that's not the case. We know the Milky Way is evolving. It doesn't even come as a surprise. We know there are other things that contribute and change the way these streams evolve. There's smaller scale structure in the Milky Way. There's potentially smaller scale dark matter structure. There's certainly smaller scale baryonic structure, bars, spiral arms, GMCs. Um, the Milky Way potential is evolving. So the Milky Way potential potential five billion years ago, when perhaps one of these streams started evolving, is not the same potential in which, in which it's evolving now. The LMC has fallen in, it's tugged things away from where they should be. Uh, and so trying to model these things kind of cohesively has actually turned out to be much more complicated because it turns out when you try to make these simplifying assumptions, uh, you get one stream that tells you, well, the potential should, should be X, and then you get a second stream that just rules X out entirely, and the answer is, oh, you needed it to take into account something like the LMC, which tugged at one of these streams, but not the other one, uh, for example. So you've got all sorts of these little examples that have popped up in the literature. I'll just flash a few of these, kind of a, a newsreel highlight. Um, Sagittarius, uh, that stream that I showed this big blog, has a bifurcation. We've known about this bifurcation for a while. Uh, how do you model a bifurcation? How do you get two different tracks? And what is the orbit if there are two different tracks uh, that you think these stars are spread out? Um, one theory here is that uh, this teaches us about the progenitor, actually, Sagittarius itself, dwarf galaxy, had rotation, had something else, flung stars out in different ways, uh, so you get a bifurcation, maybe. Uh, not necessarily the answer, but certainly an answer. Uh, GD1, the stream I showed earlier, now I can talk about all the little labels here, has all these gaps and a spur. Uh, how do you explain these gaps and, and how do you model the spur? How do you get a stream that has these, these kinds of features? Maybe this is substructure uh, in the potential. Maybe these are dark matter halos that are punching through the stream and creating uh, creating these, these under densities uh, over on, on where those two, two arrows point and pulling off a spur of stars. Um, maybe, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's an intermediate black, mass black hole that's punching through it. Uh, maybe it happened to fly by a uh, GMC. We don't think it's a GMC, uh, but who knows? Um, Why not GMC? Uh, just the orbit doesn't bring it anywhere close enough, I think, to known populations of them. Um, streams that uh, appear to be broken broken up, um, or rather two streams that we thought were two separate streams that actually turn out to be very similar in terms of their chemistries. Uh, how do you explain that? You know, did something, uh, do you try to model these as two separate orbits, or do you try to explain them as one orbit that maybe in this case, Sagittarius plowed through and pulled off an entire arm to a slightly different uh, inclination along this orbit. Uh, so there's a nice YouTube video, which if I have time, I'll show at the end, uh, which shows one simulation in which if you include Sagittarius in this, you kind of, Sagittarius plows right through here and pulls off this, this, this secondary arm. Uh, and now and then people thought for a while the two screens actually are just one screen. Um, multiple components, so similar to the, the previous one, a stream that has a, thi a thin track and then a wider track, which is a little hard to see here, but uh, below the thin track, uh, there's kind of a wider uh, over density uh, compared to the background. This one, as far as I'm aware, doesn't even have a good explanation yet, um, besides there being, well, two kind of parallel uh, stream tracks that can't really explain well in terms of a formation mechanism or something in the potential that has induced them. Um, Pal 5, the stream I showed in the beginning, has a very stark asymmetry between its leading and its trailing arm. Uh, one of the arms is quite long and thin. The other one has a fan that appears quite soon after the progenitor that's shown right here, uh, where the stars fan out. How do you get that? Well, uh, the leading explanation now is that there is an interaction with the galactic bar uh, that sweeps by and torques some of the stars in one of the arms away from their orbit. Uh, other things that have been used to, 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 to be invoked uh, to create this are flattening the potential and uh, chaos in certain regions uh, that specifically affect one of the arms here. Um, I'll address that later in the talk. Bottom line is there's a lot going on in the streams that kind of move away from this very simple picture of a smooth potential in which a stream is evolving. Uh, if you're a glass half empty type of person, you might say, okay, this is hopeless, like we're never going to get back to this original picture. A glass half full person might say, well, this is all very interesting because we're learning other things about the potential in the process, right? We're learning about the properties of progenitors. We're learning about dark matter substructure. We're learning about uh, baryonic substructure, bars, and, and so on and so forth uh, in the potential. So there's a lot of information in these perturbations and these deviations from the typical stream-like picture. 
Uh, but what I want to do is I want to bring it back to our original question, um, which is, so we've got all these possible things that we can learn from misbehaving stellar streams, but I want to go back to what is the overall galactic matter net distribution? Can we still, given all these deviations and the fact that it's actually very hard to model multiple streams with one potential, uh, can we still figure out something about the overall shape and structure of our halo um, from these streams? And so I want to come back to my solar system to Milky Way analogy uh, and talk about a different game that we play in the solar system, which is, well, I call it seeing orbital structure and seeing resonances uh, in the solar system. Here is a picture of Saturn and its rings. Um, you learn a lot about the matter distribution in and around Saturn from just a snapshot. Again, you know, we didn't need to see these rings at all. All we need is a snapshot of these rings, these over and under densities are indicative of various resonances with local moons uh, of Saturn. Uh, even I learned the other day talking to you both that you can even do seismology with these rings. Uh, you, can, you can learn about modes that are excited within Saturn uh, that induce a resonant response within the rings. You can actually learn about the magnetic distribution inside Saturn kind of to a very detailed level from looking at this very fine ring-like structure. Uh, and so the question, one of the main questions I asked in my thesis was can we do this? In the Milky Way. Can we see orbital dynamics? Can we see resonances in the Milky Way? And here we have a similar, although maybe reverse problem, as I, as I, as I mentioned before. Uh, we have a snapshot, but um, more importantly, the Milky Way is very dynamically young compared to the uh, compared to Saturn's ring. Saturn's rings have evolved, and uh, these secular resonances have taken their effect and created very clean. Uh, structure, whereas the Milky Way is, you know, between 10 and 100 um, dynamical times old, depending on how far in you go. Um, and that's not necessarily enough time to actually see the effects of these, these long-term secular resonances. Uh, and so some people might say at this point, well, we shouldn't try to play the game of looking at long-term secular effects uh, in the Milky Way. I'll try to convince you that whether you want to call it secular or not, these effects actually matter. And studying resonances and resonance structure and stable and unstable balance points uh, can teach us something very interesting about the potential of the Milky Way. Uh, to start out, um, I want to talk about what orbits look like in the vicinity or inside resonances. Um, and so I'm showing here three orbits now plotted in their radius and their, their vertical um, uh, excursion from the disk. Uh, in, in a Milky Way-like potential, this potential has a disk, um, so a flat component, which we know to exist, the baryons. It's got a halo. Um, overall, it is axisymmetric. It's oblate because the disk is, is creating some uh, um, uh, deviation from sphericity. In fact, I think in this case, my halo is also oblate. So this is a very oblate case. Uh, this orbit on the left is a very typical orbit in a galactic case. It fills out its entire orbital torus. Uh, you see that in this RZ projection as it filling out kind of the, the allowed space for this orbit, this kind of symmetrical diagram in, in R and Z. Uh, this is what a normal, I would say, orbit, a regular orbit in the potential looks like. Uh, if you look all the way to the right, you see an orbit that is basically a completely commensurate, an orbit with commensurable frequencies. Uh, the reason that orbit on the right doesn't fill out the full space like the orbit on the left is because its radial frequency and its vertical frequency are exactly the same, are one to one. So every time it does a radial oscillation, it does a vertical oscillation, and it just repeats the same figure in this R and Z plot. Uh, and so it just kind of forms more or less this line. The orbit in the middle is the one that I think is interesting. This is what we call a resonantly trapped orbit. So it's not exactly on the resonance. It's, it is deviating around or away from the resonance, but it is close enough. And because the Hamiltonian in this case depends on R and on Z, it's, uh, it's an oblate potential. Uh, it's getting tugged back to the resonance um, over many orbital periods. And it's never, never leaving to the opposite, the opposite shape. It never gets up here or down there uh, in this diagram um, because it is trapped at the resonance, it's essentially oscillating or vibrating around the resonant orbit all the way on the right. Good. We can, uh, I like to visualize these in surfaces of section. This is one of the main uh, um, projections that I think is useful to, to study these resonances. So now I'm plotting, again, the same three orbits you saw before on the left. Uh, and each time one of those orbits crosses the z equals zero line uh, going upwards. I log its 
radius, it's r, and it's, and it's radial velocity on the plot on the right. And it might be a little hard to see right now, but hopefully eventually you'll see the contours forming. Uh, the, black or, or, the black orbit, the regular orbit, is forming this big, round, uh, uh, one well, circle or almost uh, circular-like uh, uh, shape here, whereas the two resonant orbits, the one that's exactly commensurable and the one that is trapped at the resonance, uh, kind of get stuck at the very top of this plot. Uh, and just move around the very top. They never make it to the bottom. That's essentially the same statement as saying that uh, this orbit will never get to here or to here. They just stays on the top of the section. Uh, here's that plot shown with more orbits and filled out, so it's easier to see. You can see most orbits uh, in this choice of initial conditions uh, will be regular orbits. They'll, they'll, they, they are concentric around, around this point, so most of the orbits are like the black ones. But you can see that there's this class of orbits at the top and the bottom that are resonantly trapped that behave just qualitatively differently than the regular orbits. And again, I want to stress this is a smooth potential. There's no like, there's no additional structure beyond the fact that we have a an, an oblate um, uh, configuration, not a spherical one. Um, and yes, I said there's a disk. You would get this even if there weren't a disk, but you just had a smooth oblate halo. Um, good. Why does this matter? Why do I care? Uh, so here is, you can study these resonances in action angle space again, and this is what we convert to uh, slow action and slow angles. This diagram is equivalent to this diagram, which is basically, and I said it before, everything evolves very regularly here. Uh, in fact, what you get in these, in these resonantly trapped regions uh, is a very different picture. Um, where instead of this very clean linear evolution, uh, you have your librating orbits trapped in this resonant region around uh, the, the, the stable balance point, and then you've got uh, orbits above and below that kind of circulate around it, and you have to get far enough away to get back to this simple linear picture. Uh, I want to bring back that picture I showed earlier and say, now imagine instead of that evolving here, you have that blob start out here, uh, and let it evolve. And now I'll just let you imagine. I didn't. I didn't actually take the time to draw what this looks like. But just imagine if this thing is moving kind of with relatively similar frequencies. That's not necessarily true either. But let's assume they're all moving with similar frequencies along these contours. What are you going to get? It's going to look very different. It's certainly not going to give you the simple linear shearing picture that you got at the bottom of that figure on the right. Uh, bringing it back to my uh, surface of section, let's draw now a toy picture with actual kind of what is the behavior of a, of a stream here. Um, we certainly can't detect it from seeing one orbit. But if you see one orbit, that basically gives you a point on the surface of section. That tells you nothing. You could have a resonantly trapped region. You could also have a not resonantly trapped region. It would still appear as a point. So you wouldn't be able to know from just a single star and its current orbital parameters, is it resonantly trapped? You can't even do that with a distribution of points. So a snapshot of the Milky Way, if you see a lot of stars and they're all orbiting, uh, there's no way a priori to figure out if some of them are resonantly trapped or some of them are not, uh, because they, the, the thing, the, the contours of drawing them back are potential dependent. So if you don't know what the potential is, you just know the 60 phase space information of each point here, uh, you could equally draw a non-resonant picture and have them fill that equally. There's no kind of over under densities that you can easily detect. Uh, in the data if you if you start out with a smooth distribution and you evolve that way. Maybe there are, but that's a story for another time. Uh, bear with me for now. Uh, you can, however, very easily detect these, these resonances if you have two or more orbits that you know have some sort of a shared history. So if those two orbits both started on regular orbits, they will do the same picture that we saw here. They'll move along the orbits and they'll shear slightly because one of them has a slightly different frequency than the other. Whereas if those two orbits started straddling the boundary between the resonant and the non-resonant region separatrix, uh, then those two orbits will initially evolve together, but then one of them will turn around and you will split apart, uh, essentially appearing to have diverged a lot more in terms of your phases than one would expect from the typical picture. So if you know that these stars started out together and yet they're so far apart from each other, one good explanation for that is, oh, there might be a resonance, or re really, not, it doesn't even need to be a resonance. It needs to be an unstable balance point in the potential that has caused the flow to, to diverge from the typical kind of flow of two uh, contours in the potential. Uh, let's extend this to not two points, but a, an ensemble. Um, pendula are really good ways of modeling these kinds of resonances. So just imagine an ensemble of pendula 
that are evolving with similar energies. These are rigid pendulum that are either circulating all the way around or they're vibrating back and forth. Um, if all of the pendula are circulating and you start them all with slightly different circulating energies, they will all continue circulating uh, and they'll start spreading out slowly. That's again, your typical phase mixing. Same is true for the, the vibrating case, the oscillating back and forth case. If you happen to start them though, such that some of them with, with the energy such that some of them will circulate and some of them will not quite make it over the top and vibrate that middle column, things will separate out very quickly, much faster than you would expect uh, from again, your prescription, you assumed no resonances in the potential. So now back to this picture, we've, we've, we've hopefully colored this, this idea of resonances able, straddling the boundary between resonance and non-resonance able to split you apart and phase space very fast. Now imagine that this picture, which now we can think of as initial conditions, R and VR, is covered with stellar streams or with, with globular clusters that will turn into stellar streams. You just try to populate this with lots of stellar streams, maybe many more than what we observe. Uh, I filled this diagram up with stellar streams. I would argue, and I think you all should hopefully agree with me if I've done my job so far, that you would expect the density, the filamentary density of streams that were born near the, this resonance to be much less than the density or the, the, the kind of the one dimensionality of streams that were born uh, anywhere else. Uh, and so we've done that in simulation. This is the same uh, sort of axes here as the plot before. Um, is this plot just half the top half of it? Uh, except here, uh, we, we know nothing about um, kind of drawing these, these contours. All we've done is we've integrated globular clusters or, or ensembles that model globular clusters uh, in, in a galactic potential that is equivalent to that and measured their density after some several giga years. Uh, and you can see that the density is darker here corresponds to less dense. Uh, the density clearly delineates where that separatrix is. You actually see the contours of the surface of section I showed earlier in the density of streams, again, assuming that your streams cover your entire phase space to give you kind of this very detailed probe of the potential. So if we had that kind of data, we would immediately in theory find uh, these resonances because you would just look at the density of streams and say, oh, in a certain region in orbital space, my streams are much less dense. They've kind of spread out a lot more than they should. Surely that means there must be some sort of a resonance there. What does that actually look like? So here's actually a stream evolving um, near one of these uh, separatrices. Uh, some, of, some of the particles here will be trapped, some will be untrapped. Uh, so far, everything looks good, nice and thin, more or less. Uh, stops in there, we go. So far, so good. The gray line is the orbit. The leading and the trailing arm more or less delineate the orbit. So things are looking well behaved right now. Um, but wait, we're about to encounter the unstable balance point. If you look at the red points, you're going to start seeing a red component uh, that is just on the opposite side of where it should be. I'll highlight it. There it is. Uh, so look, now that's way, way away from where the orbit that we thought it was that it should be is. Uh, if you keep looking at that red component, you'll see it actually looks, it starts looking like a separate stream. Uh, and if you pause this at the right time in an opportune moment, that might just look like a separate component, or in this case, uh, pause it, it looks like a bifurcation. Uh, you've got two streams essentially that you might not have associated to begin with, or you might think that something got pulled off the stream. But here is a very elegant dynamical way that doesn't invoke needing some perturb or something else. It just naturally in this potential, uh, you get these regions where uh, the resonances will split up a stream into a resonant and a non-resonant component, and you might get these separated components or these bifurcations, perhaps similar to some of the pictures I showed earlier in my news flash of streams that misbehave. If you want to observe this, are you biased towards trying to catch it at this point when there are one stream and another one which is close to it, so you can go, ah, they might be similar, let me look at their face first. Because if you, with the movie, five, 10 seconds ago, they were on that side of the other, we would never identify them. Well, the question is, so you're, if they are, if they are, if you get two kind of distinct stream-like components, you're biased to think in two different ways, right? So in this case, you might say, ah, I see the stream and there's a component next to it, maybe this is like a bifurcation, like a GD1 has the spur. If you see them in two different sides and you still detect them, uh, so first of all, you're maybe less about you're, you're biased to not detect it if it's far away, but maybe you'll see it and you just won't associate it with the stream. Maybe you'll say there are two separate streams, and you'd, you'd have no reason to associate between them unless you happen to choose the right potential in your modeling, which would require a lot of luck. 
or you had some other indicator of say age or chemistry to say these two components are awkwardly similar kinematically, they're awkwardly similar in terms of their chemistry, and yet they're so far away from each other in the galaxy. What happened? Now that has strings that have such characteristics. There are. Uh, there are there are so there are, so I, I could show that 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 slide earlier. Um, there are certainly streams that have similar ages. There are streams that have that look more like this, where there's a bifurcation. Um, we haven't yet modeled any of them using this uh, formalism. However, so far I've only tried this on two unique cases. I haven't actually tried this kind of across the entire catalog of data, and that is certainly one of the next steps, the main next step, I think, uh, alongside what I will talk about at the end of this. If you were to go back to that slide with the zoo of the different streams, do you have chemistry for all of them or what fraction? Uh, some of them you only have like five or 10 stars for, so you don't really have great data on many of them, uh, but it's getting better. Uh, for some of them, you certainly do. Um, so the, the, the case of Jalen, which is the one that had two separate components, is a case that is both kinematic and chemical. Uh, the, the composition of the stars is similar, that's why they think it's the same stream. Uh, not yet a good explanation. Unfortunately, for everything I've tried, that's the one I really threw everything at uh, here. It does not fall near resonance in any of the potentials I looked at. So, shocks. But uh, we'll keep trying. With something like such, would it be better to look for a companion to Sagittarius? Because that's a much bigger stream, so it's the chances that it straddles a separatrix are larger. Yes, good question. Um, you're asking all the questions that I typically get at the end, but we're, we're, we're under no... no uh, type here. So Sagittarius actually suffers from uh, being too far in the extreme, I think, in this case. It's so big that it actually fills out a large portion of this that you would have to pick out kind of a very small component of it that stayed resonant, uh, and it really washes out through this, this diagram quite quickly, uh, that you wouldn't, everything I've tried, you don't, it just, you have to either catch it exactly at the right moment before regular phase mixing overtakes this accelerated phase mixing because you hit an unstable balance point. Um, or you have to see a very kind of thin component that is resonant, which is much thinner than the rest of the stream, which again would be hard to quantify and detect uh, in the data. There is a very notable bifurcation in Sagittarius. Uh, don't think it's this. Uh, you'd have to have a massive resonance, which is way inconsistent with any um, with any of the like reasonable prescriptions for the galaxy. The other problem with Sagittarius is it's way further out, so it's orbited many fewer times. You actually need a good subset of orbits to actually pass by the unstable balance point for one component to go up and the other component to go down. So you have, you would have to gotten really lucky. Uh, the unstable balance point in this plot is here. So Sagittarius would have had to be born like right around the unstable balance point. So in theory, it could happen, but it is a bunch of stretches you need to make to get there for Sagittarius. So you mentioned that there are like oh, 100 like stellar streams now in the Milky Way. Uh, do you have an estimated number, like how many of them have experienced or have hit a certain metric? I mean, say, say, remember the question, I, will, I have a slide on that exactly, uh, which I will get to. Before you get to that, mm -hmm. so you may have just given enough information to answer this, but I, I, I still don't know. It. So when this happens, if you kind of shear off into the section, you shear is dry. Is there any prior on um, what the ratio of the number of stars in those two components are, or is it just? Uh, I will address that as well, but the general idea that I have, and having studied this a bit, but perhaps not enough, is that it's purely just, you know, the size of the resonance with respect to the size of your progenitor. Uh, in most of the cases I look at, the progenitor is well, much bigger than the separatrix, which is about the boundary, but it's usually smaller than the resonance itself for the reason I just gave Chris, which is I don't want thing to wash out the entire structure. Uh, and so then it's just statistically, you know, where does the separatrix slice through it? So it's more or less 50-50 that they would be trapped or untrapped. Of course, you have to get the resonance first. Most likely you are completely untrapped. But once you are at a separatrix, I don't think there's any reason to be biased towards trapped versus untrapped, assuming you're Progenitor is smaller than the original, sorry, than, than the presently trapped region. This. Ah, good. Okay, so I so you saw a bifurcation. Uh, the more we study this, the more we see various different um, types of perturbations and well, or of morphologies that you get if you happen to evolve next to a resonance. So here are three streams, or sorry, here are five streams all with relatively similar initial conditions. Uh, so George, to your question, 
the, the difference between these streams is how many of the particles are trapped versus untrapped. Uh, so the top one is completely resonant, the bottom one is completely non-resonant, the middle one is half and half, and then you, you got it. Uh, so far, they all look thin. This is, again, that first time I, I paused reading the other picture. Um, now, three of them, all three that have some component that is a different component, uh, one of their tidal tails has fanned out. So the red tail still looks nice and thin. Uh, the blue tail seems to ex experience in all of them uh, this kind of fanning out. So there's an asymmetry in terms of each of the tails, but there's a symmetry across the separatrix so far. Uh, take a snapshot ahead of this. So this is now three giga years in. Uh, all sorts of asymmetries start popping up. So some of these now have bifurcations. Uh, so the, the component that fanned out coalesced into a, uh, a thin component again. Uh, some of them have features now in their leading arm and the red arm. Uh, some of them still maintain their fans. Uh, so a priori, this was not clear as to why you get all these different kinds of um, morphologies in the, in the streams. Um, we've, we think we've understood this relatively well just based on the resonant dynamics. Uh, a lot of this has to do not just with straddling the separatrix, but what is actually your evolution, uh, your, your, essentially your slow frequency with which you evolve in this plot? What is your, what is your pendulum frequency? <laughs> Uh, it is uh, asymmetric about the separatrix, um, and it and it diverges as you get to the separatrix. So your your pendulum uh, that is exactly at the unstable balance point never reaches the top, so that has a an infinite period or a zero frequency. Um, and so around that, you get this very sharp behavior. Uh, we plot this in the bottom uh, plot is the, the the libration period. Uh, the middle region is the resonant trapped region. Um, so you've got kind of some oscillation period in the middle, which is your harmonic oscillator. Then you move out to where it's no longer a harmonic oscillator, uh, and you diverge. Your period diverges to infinity, and then you regularize back down. But if you if you are near this uh, one of these vertical lines, which are the separatrices, uh, if you're near that, then your particles are spread around and have a very large gradient frequency. So that can induce additional kind of changes in how you expect that phase mixing to happen. Um, and so we've then gone and kind of shown how these various components, you can understand them either as, uh, in this case, I'm just showing what's trapped and what's untrapped. That's Jordan's question earlier. And you can explain the bifurcations very nicely. So we have a clean component and a clean component. Usually that means one of them is resonant, one of them is not resonant. Sorry, one of them is trapped, one of them is untrapped. Whereas if you have fans, this is usually explainable based on this libration period um, uh, gradient. Uh, so you can, you can understand that the fanned out regions. And in fact, to get a fanned out region, you don't even need to be at all straddling the separatrix. You just need to be close enough to experience this high gradient uh, in the um, in your orbital free, in your resonant frequency. Um, just another fun thing, which happened because Chris mentioned this to me a year ago, and I was like, well, we should try this. Uh, if you if you happen to evolve a few times in this diagram, if you hit the unstable balance point more than once. Uh, you will pull off additional arms. So you can actually get streams with multiple bifurcations this way. Um, more importantly, uh, I would argue this means that even if the thing has evolved for long enough for one of these bifurcations to have, you know, got um, um, blurred away into the background, it's too diffuse to actually see, as long as you evolved again past the unstable balance point, you'll pull off a new one. So if you happen to be near a separatrix near a resonance, uh, and you're evolving there, then as long as you have encountered an unstable balance point relatively recently in your history, there should be something observable in terms of your morphology. Um, so to Shang-Chi's question, uh, have we tried this on the, on the catalog of streams? Where, how, these 100 streams, where do they fall in the spectral resonance? And we've started this. Uh, and so we took a subset of streams. I, I filtered here for streams that I thought were particularly likely to be helpful. Uh, these are streams that are relatively close in, so they orbited many times. Um, uh, this is from a larger catalog. I chose only 12 streams from this catalog. Uh, you'll notice that some of these streams have very few members, so 106, 48, 233. Uh, so this is not like statistically large samples like we have for Sagittarius, for example, to actually say we see the full thing. You know, if we have, if we have 100 particles and I say that 10% of the stream has been resonantly trapped, I'm not going to say I see 10 stars and make a claim based on that. But to your question, the orbits of the streams, we more or less know what they are. What is the likelihood of one of these orbits being near a resonance in a reasonable configuration of the galaxy? So we take these 12 streams that we've filtered from this, this data set, and we, we look at, we know, we know what their current 
well, we know what their positions are in 60 base space. Uh, so we can assume what their progenitor orbit is, more or less. Uh, and then we take those orbits, uh, sorry, those, those, those 60 phase space information, not orbits, uh, and we put them into a potential ranging from oblate on the left to prolate all the way on the right. So we're just taking the halo and starting from a squashed halo and extending it. And each one of those, uh, kind of this array of halos we're looking, do any of these streams fall near Erasmus? So the stream position, sorry, the, the, the location of the progenitor now is not changing. What's changing is the potential, and therefore the resonances are kind of sweeping through as we change the shape of our potential. And we ask, you know, do we see any of these streams fall in the year and kind of, when I say, probe this resonance structure? And we do, uh, excitingly. Uh, otherwise, I maybe wouldn't be giving this talk. Um, so for two of these, two out of 12, uh, which is a not insignificant subset, um, we see them fall near one of, I, so I, all, I look for just three resonances here, just the one to one, the two to three, and the three to four. So various uh, low order frequency ratios. Um, what the, the important thing in these plots, uh, the green line uh, shows you the, um, uh, the uh, percentage of vibrating stars in the stream, assuming it's progenitor uh, orbit. So George, your question, how many of these uh, the particles are in the vibrating resonantly trapped orbit family? So it goes from zero outside the resonance to 100, in this case, in the middle of the resonance, to zero on the other side. Here's actually one that is about the size of the resonance. Uh, so it never quite reaches 100%. Is either the size? It's actually, no, it's not the size. It's grazing the resonance. So it never actually is fully engulfed by the resonance. Um, uh, so that one reaches 75% at most of trapped particles. Um, and I highlight the regions where at least 5% of the particles belong to a second orbit family. Um, so I would say, and if the potential is in any of these squashiness parameters, so the, the, the Q parameter is how... Uh, what is the ratio between the z-axis and the x or y-axis of these potentials? If the potential happens to be in any of the regions where the green area is highlighted, uh, these streams would be sensitive to the existence of a resonance. Now, these are two relatively small and not well-studied streams. So, not you know, their, their, their membership is certainly not enough to have found it. Nor have we looked to Chris's question for kind of companions that are further away that would say, you know, you really are on the other side. Uh, and so this is one of the main things we want to do, which is say, okay, do this kind of search a little bit more robustly for a larger uh, distribution of, of, an, of potential that you want to test. Find the candidate streams that are interesting that might probe a reasonable subset of potential. So this one is actually particularly interesting because uh, these ratios are what a lot of the other studies of streams have been pointing to in terms of the oblateness. Uh, the usual range that's quoted now is between 0.7 and 0.9. So in theory, this one has a chance of actually catching something interesting, um, perhaps less so for a phlegathon, which is at the prolate end, which seems relatively ruled out by some, some other studies. Um, but either way, look for these streams or find the streams that would probe the right potentials and then do some observational follow-up to look for components that are not following the expected stream track. So uh, in this test, do you include those are the like um, misbehaved as streams? And so does that help? If, if so, does that mean a that? Few, a few of them are there. So JLM is there, for example, which is one of the ones I really wanted to fit, does not fall into your resonance. So and does that mean that it cannot be due to the resonance, or is it because there's some other parameter space that if, be... if you're pessimistic, that's what you would say. If you're optimistic, like me, maybe you'll say you haven't looked in the right potentials yet. Uh, I think likely JLM is not. As, I'm certainly not going to keep looking at JLM because I've spent enough time trying to make it work and just like shooting in the dark in this space. So uh, I think better to decide based on the streams which ones are the ones that are likely rather than. It was chase one in particular that had, well, I, I actually both approaches, right? I think you should chase the ones that do have known deviations from uh, a streamlined -like structure and see if it works, but to a certain extent. Uh, and besides that, I think, and this goes back to Chris's question, uh, it's certainly likely that we haven't actually just, we just haven't seen the component that is pulled away. I mean, we've only seen many of these misbehaving streams very recently because we have more and more data and because these are the streams that people have studied a lot. So GD1 is a very, very, uh, commonly studied stream even before Gaia came out uh, because it's nice and thin and very easily observable and it's retrograde, so it means out other interactions. Uh, and so when Gaia DR2 came out, I think Adrian plugged that in and had that plot within like a few hours because he knew that he, that's, that's the stream he wanted to look at. Uh, 
a lot of these streams that I've picked out are very recently discovered streams. I haven't had a lot of, haven't seen a lot of love recently. Uh, sorry, I haven't seen a lot of love at all because they're just new and small and nobody's thought to really pay much attention to them, where actually they might be very interesting because again, the more streams we have, the more they probe the full picture of the surface of section that I showed earlier. Took about eight minutes. Uh, good. I don't need to say too much more. I'll just say, so two other things that are interesting here. Um, there is more data to come, which will help this. So LSST um, will uh, complete our catalog of our Lyra stars in particular in the galaxy, uh, which is a very good way of finding streams. Our Lyra stars are typically born in globular clusters, the ones in the halo. Uh, and so if you have a complete uh, catalog of our Lyra stars in our halo, you might easily say, okay, I see you. Three R Lyra stars below the galactic plane that have very similar kinematics to a stream that is above the galactic plane. How could they get there? How would they be there if they weren't born in the same globular cluster? Very interesting to ask. So, a complete catalog of R Lyra stars does help us kind of complete this picture of are we seeing the other components of these streams, even if they've been pulled out or fanned out, uh, but they still exist somewhere. Uh, in addition to LSST, we also have uh, Roman. Both of these will start seeing streams in other galaxies. Um, so LSST will see dwarf galaxy streams that are quite far away. Uh, Roman will start seeing globular cluster streams even in, in the local universe. Um, the more streams we have, this effect is, among other things, a morphological effect. So you will see kind of uh, bifurcations pulled off. So if you have a huge catalog of streams, you might begin imagining that you can just start seeing these kinds of effects more frequently. Uh, you might even have some sort of a statistical measure of given potential shapes in general that we have from, um, from large scale simulations, how many streams do we expect to have encountered in resonance like this? Uh, and you might say, well, we expect of 1,000 or 10,000 streams, we should see 10 or 20 that have experienced this. Why don't we see it in the data or do we actually see it in the data? Um, so yeah, just some thoughts of why this is gonna work. So I'll talk about them and I'll just leave up. Final slide. That's your question. Very nice question. Should I start? Um, time dependence of the global potential is going to be unimportant if it's slow enough that you are uh, elaboration time is short compared to the global potential. And given that the Milky Way hasn't undergone a major merger for Eight years or something. That, is this pretty robust under changes in the? Yes and no. Um, I mean, these resonances are relatively small and thin. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a big perturbation to move the resonance around. So you have the LMC fall in, it, you know, it's not necessarily what you think of as a, as, as close as we have to a major merger or even Sagittarius. Uh, it's not really changing kind of the global structure of the potential all the way in, but certainly uh, it's certain radii. It is doing enough to move these resonances around, and it is a very fast perturbation. And so, it's if I let the LMC fall in, does the red, does your average resonance shift by order of itself? Does the location of that resonance shift by order of the width of the resonance, which is much less or much larger? Uh, I don't know the answer exactly. Uh, certainly not. Um, it would be a good question to to figure out. Uh, the main reason I have not looked at that question is because, um, I mean, it would be good to know. It doesn't actually change the effect as long as the resonance is still there. Uh, what it changes is, so let's say I see something and it was it, it experienced this effect. It, it hit the unstable balance point before Sagittarius moved the resonance away. What I'm constraining is the potential before Sagittarius did that. So it would be good to figure out what Sagittarius did, um, but I'm at least figuring out the location of a resonance in a pre-Sagittarius encounter potential, which I think would also be interesting. I suppose if you, if you think of in the extreme case that something falls in and you just switch off the resonance because it actually goes so far away, and then everything will be blurred out by phase mixing, but I suppose Eventually. the time scale is so long for that. Eventually, but it, as, as long as you've done this, so if you have, is my picture of the two orbits that go next to each other. As long as you turn around, that's, I mean, you, you only erase that once you've phase mixed enough, which will happen even if the potential doesn't change. Uh, so if you do this and then you erase the resonance, 
what's done is done. This stream has been fanned out. You're going to have a component that's always on a different or a different seeming orbit uh, than the rest of the stream. And it, it might look like it's on a very different phase. It might look like uh, you know you've got two streams uh, that have a very similar or they have very similar orbital parameters. If this resonance is thin enough, the delta j in this case would be very small, uh, but they'll be at a very very different phase. So you might think they're just two streams that were born in very different phases on the same orbit. Or if you were clever, you would model it this way. You'd figure out there was a resonance there. I have a naive question. So I, you know, you've convinced me of the importance of, of considering resonances and so on. But if we were just to go back to the pre-Saturn rings picture, um, I can imagine modeling the potential as some kind of smooth component, maybe with some random field on top of it, uh, and then just, you know, seeing what different statistical realizations of that would lead to in terms of distributions and phase space. Is that just impossible to do because of the number of degrees of freedom? And yes, and, and how much orbit integration you'd have to do to get there. Yeah, it is. I mean, in theory, what in theory, all of this is, is garbage. All you want to do is look at a stream, you just have a bunch of stars, just rewind their orbits yeah. and find the right potential such that they all coalesce to or to the to the to the tidal radius and the escape velocity. Uh, of the globular cluster that you think they were born in. Uh, it turns out that doing that for like more than eight or nine stars is just a computationally intractable problem, even for one stream, let alone doing it for multiple streams. Uh, the problem is here you've got so you got many degrees of freedom in terms of your observed data. Uh, the assumptions you make about what is the size of the progenitor, what is the time that things will leak from the progenitor, and then of course the potential space that you're investigating. But there aren't like attractors and like I, I, like again, you can imagine constructing a whole bunch of statistical realizations and so there are uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, it would be uh, I was certainly people have worked on it and are working on it it's getting better and there are various computational techniques that are uh, improving this considerably um, uh, great so I mean one of the main ways that you do this is by by computing gradients efficiently um, because then you get kind of evolution of an orbit in a uh, and an orbit integrator, and that has improved a lot in the last like five, ten years. And so these things are happening, uh, but certainly right now we need we end up always using some uh, dumbed down projection, for lack of a better word, of the stream to try to fit it. So it's usually a generative model where you say, okay, I'm going to assume I'm going to figure out what the actions of my progenitor are. I'm going to use action angle formalism to project forward and draw from that distribution and see if I can fit the stream is, for example, one way that that's done. Uh, you do this in action space where you try to get the actions to focus, but again, you make the assumptions about actions and what the original configuration in action space was. So there's, and so all these usually involve some projection of the data, uh, choosing it in a wise way. Chris and I are talking about another one that we've done writing up, but uh, uh, there, there are various ways to do this that kind of circumvent the computational problem, but they always involve lowering the information. You didn't say much about clumpy dark matter. So does that mean that residences seem to explain the structures we see, or do we still think that clumpy dark matter is necessary? Uh, no, I think it's very different. It's a good question. And I think it's so uh, when uh, Adrian was working on this paper in G1, there were in theory maybe a sub halo punch, a dark matter, but some halo, sub halo punch through the stream, which would be pretty exciting if it were. Um, he asked me, can you do the same thing with this? Uh, the answer is not, it's very challenging to do that kind of a local. So uh, clumpy dark matter in particular, if it's a small subhalo kind of uh, type that you would expect that a stream would encounter, uh, not like a dwarf galaxy size subhalo, which has a very different effect. Um, it's a very local effect. It kind of disturbs a very specific portion of the stream. It pulls off a spur, as you maybe saw in that picture. That spur is not an orbit. That spur is a time, it's that, that spur will phase mix away very quickly. It's just a local, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a chance alignment of the stars as they're being pulled away from the rest of the stream. The bifurcations that I show here are actually all well-modeled orbits. In any potential you choose, uh, you might not model them as a resonant orbit, but they, they are all kind of, these won't phase mix away. They will stay coherent streams in the, in the, in the simulation I showed you, you actually saw that kind of two red streams evolving next to each other. So there is actually very nice ways to differentiate between substructure in this case, uh, and this global potential. It's harder to do when you're talking about big sub halo that kind of plows through and splits the stream off, because then you can actually get a perturbation that changes the actions of the entire stream, of an entire component of the stream 
coherently. Uh, and then you get two streams that might just look like this. But generally, substructure has much more local, localized gap in bifurcation formation that you can differentiate. If I take the relaxation time for a fuzzy dot by the head up, and then I apply it to work out how long would it take to blur out one of these features? Because it's a very narrow feature. The, how long does it take me to be diffused across the resonance? across the resonance. And I get the time scale for that. I suspect it would be too, I suspect it would say we would blur it out. Yes. So we right. ruled out fuzzy dark matter. Uh, we haven't found any of these yet, so maybe not. Maybe, maybe we've ruled in fuzzy dark matter. Uh, because we haven't seen any bifurcated streams like this. Okay, <laughs> any more? Not let's thank Tom once again. <laughs>